you're living in Beit El, right? And then you move you move to Yerushalayim, right? So the Mount of Olives is famous for one thing: dead people. Why are you there? Well, it's famous for uh, for a special breed of dead people called the Jewish people, and uh, being a, a tribal entity, a, a peoples that ha- are a big family, our dead are important to us. Uh, our dead are our uh, connection to the past. We treat the bodies of the dead with a lot of respect, and we furthermore have in our theology, in our religion, the belief that the Jewish people are going to, that the dead of the Jewish people are going to arise one day. And, you know, that's a, a doctrine that's hard to understand or imagine, but it is the case that it is... Uh, we respect the bodies of the Jewish people, and the most ancient Jewish cemetery that uh, holds, it's, it's 150,000 Jews buried for the last 2,000 years. Uh, it is on the Mount of Olives. It faces the Temple Mount. It is on the uh, eastern slopes of Jerusalem in that the wind from the ocean comes from the west towards the east and blows any smells uh, away from the city, so they're not on the west side of the city, they're on the east side of the city. And we have a uh, beautiful um, community there that is that is close to the cemetery. And its job is to protect the Jewish cemetery from being overrun uh, by elements that would destroy tombs, like the Jordanians did uh, in their occupation from 1948 to 1967. They uh, did not uh, protect those tombs when they occupied that land. They used tombstones for construction, and uh, we have found an incredible amount of construction uh, that was uh, the buildings that have Jewish tombstones in them, in the walls. So the only way to stop that is by um, forthrightly holding on to our land, living in those parts that are sensitive, and really retaking the city. Retaking the city uh, away from elements who uh, do not welcome Jewish presence there. And what I am talking about is the jihadist uh, elements that do not welcome the Jewish presence and in in back to the homeland. And, of course, that's, that's an unnatural state of affairs because the Jewish people have every right to be in Jerusalem and in Israel because we are the ancestral peoples of that land. Uh, we have returned. We are an indigenous people trying to regain our rights. And uh, we have a next the city, uh, the greater city of Jerusalem, uh, back to its natural form, which is not a divided city. And we are starting as a people to slowly but surely uh, fill out those places that have been Judenrein, have been, have been uh, Jews have been evicted. So we are fighting to get back to them. Uh, and we're fighting to reclaim. That does not mean that we live in conflict with our neighbors. Uh, we try to have uh, decent relations, decent neighborly relations. We're not trying to evict anybody else. We are trying to stop uh, from being evicted. We're trying to assert our rights. And we are surrounding the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is the heart of the Jewish people. It's the heart of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the heart of Israel. And Israel is the heart of the Jewish world. And uh, to surround it by a big embrace, a hug of its people, uh, to show that we're back in love with our city. We're not just pining away, but we're actually putting our, 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 our hands in, in, the, in the dirt and, uh, and putting up Jewish buildings. Uh, so we're living in peace, but we're also living uh, without sacrificing our rights. We are asserting ourselves, and uh, it's a beautiful life. Do you sense that there is any bridging, that there is any room on a person-to-person, as opposed to a government-to-government level, in which we can exist within the Holy City? Um, there is a stream of, for lack of better words, Muslim Zionism. It's that's, that's really an exaggerated form of saying it, but what it means is that the idea that the Jewish people will come back to the land of Israel is uh, extant in the Quran and in Muslim theology. And it, the thing about Muslim theology is, is that it, could, it, could, it, it is not a constant. It's, it's a very fluid thing. And depending on the rulers and depending on the atmosphere of the times, Uh, It could go from Sufism, which is a mild form of Islam and a more tolerant one, to jihadism, which is uh, an an extreme and and virulent and anti-other people's uh, ideology. So when it comes to Jerusalem, um, you know, Jerusalem was a kind of add-on to the Islamic world later on down the line. And, of course, uh, 
uh, w was conquered and, and has a lot of Islamic history. Um, but, but there are verses in the Quran that say that the Jewish people are going to come back home. And the very fact that we've been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve, it in itself speaks volumes to them. But the thing is, is that has to be told to them in words that they can digest. What do I mean? Uh, when I deal with Arabs, uh, I often will remind them, I'll, I'll make them look around, and I say, look at all this, what, what has happened? Look at this Jerusalem, this Jewish Jerusalem. And I ask them, do you believe that we were able to defeat you? Do you really believe that, that the small, tiny Jewish nation was able to, to hold back six Arab armies? There's only one reason why the Jewish people were able to do that, and that's because Allah chose that to be so. And, and when, they, when they hear me talk about Allah choosing Jerusalem for the Jews, uh, they, are, they, they, they kind of get, they recoil a little bit, especially because I remind them how much Allah loves them too, as he's given them 22 countries with oil coming out of the ground. But, um, but, but Israel does not always assert, certainly does, certainly does not assert Allah, or does not always uh, act in a very Middle Eastern fashion vis-a-vis -vis the type of people who would undermine its sovereignty. Uh, a normal Middle Eastern sovereign would not allow uh, a presence inside its country to start to eat away its, its, at its sovereignty and see how the Jordanians dealt with the PLO in Black September. Uh, they killed thousands. They killed thousands in order to, uh, to eliminate any challenge to their sovereignty. So... Uh, not that I'm recommending killing thousands, but I'm showing that, that, the, that in the Middle East, when you sense that somebody wants to assert away, uh, take away your rights by asserting theirs, uh, you, have to, you have to react uh, quickly. And when Israel doesn't react quickly to somebody else's assertions, when Israel does not say that God gave us this land, uh, that weakens its position in the Middle East. There's no vacuum. Any land that's unclaimed is going to, somebody else is going to assert rights. So in the Middle East, it's not an atmosphere that somebody's going to... It's not like here you know, in Canada when, when, when four cars come to an uh, intersection and they're going to be stopped for a while saying, you go, you go, you go. It's not like that in the Middle East. People, somebody's going to assert immediately, and you have to counter that. What do you think the biggest challenges are? For whom? For the Jews? For, for Israel? For Ishai, For Jews in Israel? For Israel in the world? Uh, for Israel, the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is to know itself. And uh, knowing knowing oneself, you know, is is one of the toughest things. To know what your potential is, to know how to fill that potential without being haughty, it's tricky. The Jewish people are always uh, on on some kind of spectrum between humility by being smashed and haughtiness by feeling that God loves us. So we have to always try to, try to balance those things. So for Israel to fall in love with itself, it needs to fall in love with Jewish culture again. It needs to understand that the physical return to the land of Israel was the first step, but not the last step. The first step was the physical birth of this child. But to imbue it with, with spirit, with meaning, with content, with knowledge, uh, with a love of, of Jewish tradition, heritage, that's something that has yet to totally come to fruition. And that's the next step. W along with that is a sense of confidence about our rights to be there, and, and asserting those rights, uh, uh, not letting other people eat away at our democracy or eat away at our, at our physical uh, land, uh, Judea and Samaria, Gaza, Sinai, and so southern Lebanon. Uh, we, we are uh, constantly in, in a state where people want to eat away uh, at our land holdings because they want to undermine our security and take it to the next step. So w with, with knowing oneself comes a greater posture for, for defending what's yours, uh, it comes also from really a historical and, and religious and cultural outlook. Uh, but it's, those are not separate things. Security is not separate from the child in Israel knowing why he's lighting the Hanukkah candle. Uh, those are two similar things because the, the Maccabees fought for territorial integrity, fought for a cultural purity and independence. And uh, if, you, if you don't understand what Hanukkah is about, you don't understand what Hebron's about, you don't understand what... Gaza is about, and, 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 and you'll start to believe the propaganda and the lies and the, and the uh, uh, delegitimization, which is the day-to-day the, the -day struggle of Israel. So you've got to know yourself. Uh, uh, and that's also, for example, Jerusalem, the issue of Jerusalem. It's when you don't assert your rights over Jerusalem, when you let people start to uh, immigrate, uh, uh, take away sovereignty, your police is afraid to enter uh, an Arab village, it, it becomes a, a situation where you've lost 
a chunk of your land, you've lost a chunk of your identity. Uh, the Mount of Olives is part of our Jewish identity. It's part of our history and, and, our, and our collective unconscious. Without that, we, we are lesser ourselves. So uh, it, it's important. It's also important to have a Middle Eastern identity, to know that we are actually not just a Western people, or Western, or Israel is not a Western outpost of democracy or of the West. We're a Middle Eastern people, and we know how to face the challenges in the Middle East as Middle Easterners. We speak a Middle Eastern language. We 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 pray to God in a Middle Eastern style, and we know how to deal with Middle Eastern challenges. And we don't try to take them. We don't. We're not suckers, which is the 11th commandment. Don't be a sucker. Alti Afraya. You know, if you don't understand that in the Middle East, you are, you are doomed to fail. The Torah is there to give us information on top of Derech Eretz. Derech Eretz, i.e., understand the way of the land, literally the way of the country. If you don't understand how to act in your region, uh, no Torah is going to help you. You have to have common sense and on top of that build a, a Torah. For some reason, for Jewish people, when we leave Torah, we also leave common sense. It's a strange business. And sometimes even when we have Torah, we don't have common sense. So common sense and, and a Middle Eastern tradition is very, very important to return to. That's on the national level. On a, on a personal, Yishai Fleischer level, I guess, you know, my challenge is to, uh, look, uh, you know, I don't want to scare anybody. And, and my, my biggest, one of the biggest things that I fight everywhere I go is fear. Uh, and, and I'm always trying to point out to people what fear is, how fear manifests itself, where it lurks, and it lurks in, in, in words such as pragmatism, realism, we can't do what we want, we have to listen to America or to the world, yeah, we're afraid of the Arabs, we have to listen to Jordan when it says we can't fix a bridge to the Temple Mount. The fear hides in all kinds of pragmatic philosophy, which is, which is nothing but justification for, for a fearful uh, stance. So, uh, you know, I'm always fighting fear. That being said, uh, one of my challenges is to survive. You know, I have to I have to survive, and I have to survive without being overly defensive, with with being uh, a free a free person. But I live in a in a place where where my 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 day to day, you know, the, the, my my personal survival is also you know on the table. How do we survive? We survive by having faith in God and 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 carrying a, a sidearm and and knowing how to use it, uh, and 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 also having normalization with our with our cousins. All these things. Survival is an important thing, but in top of survival, you know, it's it's a funny thing about being what I am. I am a Zionist. I might not use that word in different outlets. I might be in a Chabad synagogue. I might not say the word Zionist because they simply understand it differently than I do, and therefore, I'm instead of making my point, I'm just hitting some kind of barrier. So I will use words like uh, Eretz Yisrael, and the, I can I'll, and I'll change the modulation of how it sounds. Eretz uh, Israel or Eretz Israel, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I don't care. I'll do that because I'm just trying to communicate, and I'm not trying to get my cultural way across. Um, uh, uh, Eretz Israel. What I'm trying to say is that Eretz Israel, to make it an Eretz Israel, there's another component which is economics, and again, that has a lot to do with faith. But people have to make it. You have to make it in Israel, and Israel wants you to make it. It is a good land. It will. It will. It will give you every opportunity to make it. Uh, it, it, it wants you to come home. Uh, that being said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a still a struggle. The land and God want you to make it, but people sometimes give you not the same opportunities. So it's important to, to also um, make it. And that's what I'm always telling my, my young immigrant friends or old immigrant friends. I say to them, you know, the most important thing is also that you have to know that you, your success is part of the Jewish people's project. It's basically uh, a greenhouse. Where, where little roots are, are where we are we are helping little roots take root in the land, and that's that's what I want to see. I want to see people take root, and I want to see myself take root. And I, you know, my challenge is to be there without a family, to educate my my child in the values of Torah and in knowledge, which I think is uh, uh, part of Torah. I think mathematics and everything else is part of Torah. I think it's God's world. I, I came from a science family. To me, you know secular knowledge, quote-unquote, is not secular. It's part of God's world. So I, I, I don't even call Torah umada. It's Torah. Everything, all, you know, knowledge is Torah. So to teach my child in, in that in that uh, faith path, um, to be a good father, to be a good husband, uh, to be successful so that I could help, you know, promote God in this world, um, and, and to live a life of meaning, meaning and satisfaction. Those are the challenges.
However, maybe I'll make one tiny caveat. I don't think, I personally don't believe that a person has to uh, max out his potential. I don't believe that we're working for our personal potential. I, work with, I think that we're working for God's potential. Sometimes certain aspects of our potential, we might be amazing ability to be rock stars, but maybe the Shem doesn't want you to be a rock star. So I, I'm not a big believer in serving the self. I'm a big believer in trying to serve the, the greater good. Uh, and within that, of course, making it, surviving, and, 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 and having a life. What do you see the process that you're part of uh, in terms of bringing some kind of unity of purpose uh, to the Jewish people? I think, first thing I want to say, that you, you really put the question very well. And, and I think that um, your question is really one of... Uh, do we have a positive view on what's going on? The ironic thing about our time is that we are living in an, in an inordinately, inordinately amazing, irregularly miraculous era. The revelation of goodness, and goodness is related even in English to godliness, is unprecedented. God's hand has never shown itself like this since the splitting of the Red Sea. The Six-Day War was equal, in my mind, to the revelation at the, at the uh, Red Sea, and if maybe I should say I even more, maybe a you know, radical thing to say, but the combination of the Holocaust and the rebirth of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, that is a showstopper. You know, to, 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 to see the, 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 the almost utter destruction of the Jewish people and suddenly this rebirth in the land of Israel, the same people who came out of the, the ghettos and the, and the Holocaust fighting tenaciously for a land, it is just, you know, historians, serious historians, just are amazed by it. Uh, I remember reading uh, Hoffer, uh, and he was just, uh, he would just say, he was like, the, nobody understood, nobody believed that these people that were being destroyed would suddenly become so tenacious just a few months later. Uh, and so, so we are living in a time of absolute miracles. And, and really, I think that your question is, is very much, uh, the answer to your question is very much dependent on the mindset uh, that you and the, the the processor by which you receive and process your information. Uh, first thing, Jews are oftentimes ad addicted to negativity. They they think that they love they show their love through commiseration with pain. It's like oi and krecht and but that's actually how I love you because I share your pain. But 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 really, I think that's a that's a mentality that that has uh, you know needs to subside in general, and that is because we're living in a time of and then there's a verse in, in, in the Psalms, Psalm 90, where Moshe Rabbeinu says, God, show us good days like you showed us bad days. I love that ver verse because it's, 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 it's Moshe Rabbeinu saying this. this isn't, he's saying, show us good, you've shown us bad, and we've, we have served you faithfully through the bad. Now show us good to equal that bad. We're living in a time where God is showing us good, but we're still in the mindset of he's showing us bad. Uh, to me... I, I, I daily, and, and this, is not, uh, this is not a propaganda or ideological thing that I'm saying. It's just the makeup that, that the way I, my, my brain has uh, either been educated or constructed is that I see amazing positive stuff every day. And it's, 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 it's sometimes a joke to me. Here's a, here's a joke. When Ahmadinejad says to, to us, Israel's about to rot away from within. It's about to be destroyed. It's about to, to just implode. I'm thinking to myself, are you joking me? You're a, you're a dictator who has to suppress people all the time in order to get your way. Everybody hates you. Your neighbors hate you. Your, your people hate you because you're a murderer. And your whole thing is based on suppression. And you're telling me about Israel, which is, which is bubbling, bubbling full of life, fruit trees, children everywhere, g play yards, uh, old men and old women playing with their children in the streets of Jerusalem like chapter 8 in Zechariah. Okay, it's all so real and tangible. It is the fruit of Israel. I mean, everything that's a fruit is so juicy. It's, it's, it's all over. Life is so rich. And, 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 uh, and I, you know, and I'm, uh, and I think to myself that people have to, first thing, want to receive the good news and to, to see the good things. Nobody knows how many children are born a month in Yerushalayim, Jewish children. And the answer is 2,000. 2,000 new Jewish children uh, uh, being born every month in Yerushalayim, Yerukodesh. 
And God says, I will not come up into the upper Yerushalayim until I come to the lower Yerushalayim. And I feel that when I come to the Mamilla Mall. The Mamilla Mall is a miraculous extension of the old city with shops and with life. And, and to me, it's a miraculous thing. You can say, I don't want to see this westernism. Somebody told me, I don't want to see Toronto and Jerusalem. I said, that's because that's what you're looking at it. Your, your whole uh, perspective is, is skewed. Look at it that life is coming back to your shalom. Another place that I love is Shari Tzedek Hospital. The healing that goes on there. The birth that goes on there. The life. The, 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 the love of medicine, which is a, Jew, a love that, that is a, a, a special connection that Jews have to medicine. So, you know, media is a machine that for some reason has decided that, that, that negativity sells more. I, by the way, I'm not sure that that is an objective truth. I think that they have decided that is an objective truth. I myself know that, that my wife loves good news and loves to write good news. You know, and, and there are organizations like Israel 21C. I don't always agree with their politics, but I love the idea. They want to sell us the good news. So people do like good news. I like Discovery. I never watch regular stuff. I always like Discovery Channel, like C-SPAN. I like to see building. I like to see things happening right. So if you orient yourself towards positivity, you see it all the time. And then you realize that we're living in the best time of Jewish history in 2,000 years. And that we're involved in the most exciting project of the Jewish people in 2,000 years. So, so really it's a choice. Do you want to fall in love with it? And I guess maybe for your audience, for Kosher Tube, I'd like to add that maybe um, sometimes the reason we see negativity is because we want to justify all kinds of positions. Sometimes we may even feel guilt about where we're at in our station in life. So we want to see the negativity in the other so that we feel a little bit better about ourselves. And that's true about even being jealous of somebody else who's successful or something else. You know, it's like because you want to feel good about yourself. So I say we have to mature out of that and really root for Israel to do well, which it is doing well. Where are we? You know, we're standing between Hanukkah and Purim. But where are we as the Jewish people now? What are we missing? I think, I think, hmm? I, I, I think, I think we're in a time where it's, uh, I, I, let, let me talk about my feelings right now. You know, as I'm here uh, in Toronto, I have particular feelings and particular, particular things that are that are you know touching my my soul right now. And I, I think uh, I think what we're not sharing yet amongst all the Jewish people is a joint vision. I think that's what we're missing. We have to have a joint vision in order to to build that Jerusalem. And Jewish efforts, Jewish money, is is spread out. And I think that we have to take a hint from the Six Day War and from the birth of the State of Israel, that there's a general ingathering that is being, that is being, uh, uh, call, a general recall that is happening right now. And I think, to me, if I was, for example, the President of Israel, and I would get up in front of, you know, big forums, I would say, Jewish people, my recommendation is, let us focus our wealth and our, let me step back. There's a, there's a type of solar energy out there, the, the solar fields, that what they do is, they have this big round a area, and they have these mirrors that focus the sunlight into the center. And in the center, there's actually a little uh, globe with water, and it superheats that water, and the water steams out, and it turns a turbine. If, if, I, if I could speak to the Jewish people, I would say to them, let us now turn our focus. Oh, we, were, we were, for the last 2,000 years, centered and focused on creating the small environment and the environs around us to create a Jewish life and to hold it together. And it's been amazing. See, I don't hate the diaspora, and I don't hate the past. I love it, and I know what it did. I, I just claim that we're changing a period right now. There's a scene change, and the scene change is, it needs a focus change. The focus change has to be that we have to create a Jewish state together. So the wealth and the power and the, and the success that, that North American Jews have is, is a God's gift. And to, to negate that and relegate it away is wrong. But uh, when I see $56 million synagogues being built in Englewood, New Jersey, I say that's a mistake. I tell them build a $23 million synagogue and build a copy of it in, in, in Yerushalayim. Uh, or, or stay with your old shul and build their, your next shul. Build it for your children. Do you love yourself or do you love your children? Because your children are going home. And the same thing in this amazing country of Canada and Toronto. It's like, look, when I see humongous Jewish building taking place, on the one hand, I feel that very natural, almost genetic call of the Jewish people to build institutions around them, from shuls to, 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 to 
educational institutions to mikvaot. That's the right thing to do. It's the right tendency. But, but, but folks, we're not living in a time where we should be living, the, the, uh, developing Toronto. That's my opinion. And, and, and I myself, because I have feelings for the world and feelings for all Jews, I don't, it's not easy for me to say fair. I'm not saying fair. But I'm saying I, I do believe that we have to make a, 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 a national decision. We have to have national thinking now. And when I see schools like I see here in Toronto, and I'm thinking to myself, well, we don't have a school like that in Jerusalem, then I think that we're making some counter... Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Counter, uh, uh, counterproductive, and and uh, counterrevolutionary, <laughs> counterrevolutionary moves. Because we're we're in a revolution, and 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 I would just I would if I could I would just come to those uh, millionaires and I would cry in front of them and I would tell them please, you know let's build Jerusalem together, let's make Jerusalem our focus. And, and we'll do what we need to do to, to continue Toronto and New York and L.A. We'll do that. We won't, we won't forget the children here, God forbid. But, but, we, but we need to start shifting our focus to that national goal. It happened to me in real, in real life today that I was at a, a very prominent institution here in Toronto, and I taught golden children, you know, golden. Really, these, some of these kids here are just... They're so smart and they're so uh, they're so they're, they're so noble like they really have a good character traits here in Canada. They're not rebellious. It's really a very beautiful thing, and they want to learn. They have open ears, and and they love Israel. Uh, but the the surroundings that they're in are really some of the most privileged surroundings I've ever seen for any Jews. And they don't take it for granted. And and again, I, I'm not trying to bust anybody. I'm not trying to undermine people's good efforts. But I am saying that when I was in that library today, I, I actually cried. I had to cry because I thought to myself, we're, we're, we're sinking deep roots in a land that is rootless for us. And if you go anywhere in New York or Toronto, you know that every 20 years, uh, uh, popula Jewish population moves because we slide around in the diaspora. Uh, we slide around like a fried egg on a Teflon pan. And, uh, and I, you know, so I, I applaud the people who are building for the future of, of the Jewish people. And I know that Jewish education is so important. But we have to, we have to, we have to sh shift our focus, 20% of our focus, 50% of our focus, uh, onto building a country that is going to be the real future. And I'll give it one final example. Let's not talk about sad things. But people, you know, we do live 120 years and we uh, finish our career in this world in this corporeal form. And I always tell people, buy a plot in your Shalim or in Israel. Because your children are, they may come to uh, Thornhill and they may come to Hackensack or, may or it may become very hard for them to fly and to visit you. Do them a favor. If you love your children and if you love yourself, bury yourself in your Shalim. My father is buried in your Shalim. And every time I drive from your Shalim to Tel Aviv, I wave to him, I pop by him, I talk to my dad. Uh, and uh, and I let him know what's going on with the family and and I have a relationship with my with my dead father and I guess that 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 you know we're ending where we began where we're talking about the Mount of Olives you know we are one people and and uh, and I I want to recommend and, and part of that building the future of your Jerusalem you know give yourself eternal life by by plugging into that story and and don't make your kids have to pine away for you you know help them make it easier by by planning for their future and planning to uh, to be amongst those who rise up from the dead in your life. Amen. Should be soon. Amen.